picking up the pieces. Two weeks after a deadly explosion rocked the capital of Beirut, the Lebanese people are struggling to rebuild their city. Hello, I'm Mike Walter, sitting in for Anna Naidu, and this is The Heat. Lebanon has been in crisis mode for years, but it was only after a deadly blast ripped through a Beirut port earlier this month, killing hundreds, that the world finally took notice. Now as the dust settles, the country is left with a political vacuum, a shattered economy, and a health crisis. With shock turning to anger, many are left wondering if the tragedy will bring about any real and lasting change to Lebanon. For more on this crisis in Lebanon, let's bring in our panel, Ravida Degram, joins us from Beirut. She's founder and executive chairman of Beirut Institute. From Dayton, Ohio, Randa Slim is director of conflict resolution in the Track 2 Dialogues program at the Middle East Institute. And from Be Beirut uh, via Skype, Sarah El Yafi is a public policy consultant and political activist. And Dottie Francis is a Lebanese journalist based in the capital. I want to welcome all of you to the show. Uh, Ravita, why don't I start with you? I mean, uh, Lebanese investigators, with the help of the FBI and uh, French officials, are now looking into why was this uh, material stored there, uh, you know, basically uh, unsafely in this warehouse. Now, we've seen what happened, this explosion, this mushroom cloud, close to 200 people killed. Um, no certainty about what actually happened. They're still trying to figure all of this out. And yet the president of Lebanon says there's no way Hezbollah was st storing weapons there. Um, and yet a lot of people in Lebanon feel like they're either directly or indirectly uh, responsible for this. So give me your sense of, of what's at stake here. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just give you a personal sense first. You spoke of picking up pieces. I am personally picking up my pieces of my life because I uh, have an apartment, had an apartment, in this big black building overlooking the port. And therefore, if you look at it right now, you will see that it's totally hallowed. I am picking up pieces from my ruined home, looking for memories, looking for a CD that has my writings for 20, 15 years in, with al Haya or something like that. So it's really the agony is amazingly uh, heavy for every and each person. And on my floor, the same floor where my apartment was, is maybe to be in the future, uh, a neighbor of mine was killed in front of her own children. Another neighbor had to tear away the children from their mother's corpse and, and in order to save them. This is the sort of tragedy that we're going through. And it is a crime against humanity to store this material and to be so negligent about it. Over the number of years, we have a prime minister who had no time, said he, quoted by someone who uh, was trying to inform him of the presence of this material there. It says, not now, later. It's not the right time. We have a president who admitted uh, that he knew about it and he instructed some but then he never bothered to follow and a, and a speaker of the house who did a similar thing so therefore I really think that this is uh, treason in effect I think people should really think about this uh, in, in, the, in the terms of treason because you do not put a bomb of this nature eventually what's what amounted to among civilians so then this is one level second level you have a paramilitary force Hezbollah uh, who uh, is uh, who is clear about reporting back to Tehran and the president uh, Michel Aoun who says well it is not the weapons of Hezbollah that were there while he says there is investigation going on you know bear with me a little bit of respect for the agony of people we're still burying the dead I think it is important to take a look at the picture of agony a, a total collapse of the economy corruption that is allure from, or by everybody it's like a cartel infested with by greed and corruption and pain a lot of pain you, Mike you're talking a about a lot of pain the agony of the people Dottie I thought well I saw a video with you online that I thought was really interesting because it was just two words you you said everyone died that that, that this was different than what we've seen in in Beirut and exactly. in Lebanon in the past exactly, talk sir, to us and about this is that. what I wrote Exactly, and this is actually what I wrote down to reply to Mrs. Ragida. With all due respect, first of all, I would like to uh, say we, your, our feelings are with her ever since we watched uh, her talking about 
her loss and with everyone, uh, the 300,000 Lebanese that lost their homes uh, and all the victims that died, it is our our wound, everybody is wounded, it's our city, it's our dreams, our future. But second of all, with yeah. all due respect, uh, she doesn't represent all the Lebanese uh, vision or all the Lebanese point of view. And uh, just to re go right to place and start uh, putting treason and I'm not, in the, I'm not in place to defend the president or this government, but we have to state that this negligence, this problem, is 6.5 years old. It's not three years old. There was four governments, many prime ministers, when the ammonium nitrate arrived and was stored and was put in Lebanon and kept on staying in Lebanon. There are many parties that are involved in this ne negligence. The ministers, the that's prime fine. ministers. That's fine. The, I, uh, that's fine. That's fine. I said a cartel. I said a please cartel me, of please everybody. Let me, let me, so please, let me believe. Please. please let me. No, no, no. Let I said a cartel no, of no, politicians. No, no. Uh, let's let's let Tari let Tari finish. Her, let let her finish her point, and then you can jump in. Because okay? I I did not I did not I yeah. And I'm I did not, not here to argue with her or anybody. But don't put words in my mouth. I will not yeah. argue, but I will just very um, s uh, simply step out kindly, do not take, put words in my mouth. I said a cartel of all politicians in Lebanon. Now please do not comment on what I say, half what you say, yes. and otherwise I'm not here to engage with you, please. If I knew this is engaging, I would not appear with you. Dari, go ahead and finish your point. Uh, first of all, with all my with all my respect, yes. I, what I'm trying to say is that it's all the ministers for six years, all the pri uh, all the prime ministers, even two presidents. We cannot say it's one president. I'm sure that uh, all of the Lebanese are angry at all the political parties. She is so she wrote, so right in the idea that she said it's a cartel of all the political parties that were affiliated in all the governments for six years, for God's sake. Plus those people who died. Those people who are suffering today, they represent or they like all kinds of political parties. And this is probably uh, a misfortune for us as Lebanese. But you can see the, the, the people, the, the young uh, girls and boys who died, they have parents who are with all these political parties. And some of them are Shiite, some of them are Hezbollah, some of them are against Hezbollah. So we cannot come here and just say that all of the people have the same point of view towards that. Uh, number two. Uh, yes. Nobody said they that. They report to Tehran. Nobody said report that. To the United States. Nobody said all the people. I'm please saying my point of view. Be a journalist. Please. I did not say that. Please, madam, I'm saying my please point of view. Please do not say that I I'm said that. I'm saying my point of no, view about no. this. No, this is not. This you are you are changing my words. I did not speak in anybody's name. I spoke in my own opinion. So do not be a good journalist. Listen to okay, what I'm, people I'm, say. And I'm speaking do not in just my come opinion. and talk to please me like not, that. Please do, do not, not speak like that. No. Okay, I don't want to get too bogged uh, down I'm, in this back and forth. Like let, let, me, uh, let me just stop you both there. And, and I got a question for Randa. Do not. Uh, Lebanon's uh, entire no, cabinet, would, of course, would, quit in the aftermath of this blast. Uh, the government relegated a, a caretaker status right now. The president, though, says he is not going to resign and step down. Well, what's going to happen as a result of this? Look, I think I've, I think there are two scenarios facing Lebanon. Uh, I'm very sympathetic to the demands of the protesters and, uh, and to the demands of the Lebanese people. You know, I'm the last one here to pontificate on what Lebanon should do and should, should you know, what Lebanese should do. I sit, live in boring, calm, safe Dayton, Ohio. And so I'm Lebanese Americans. My family is in Beirut, but it's nothing compared to what the other colleagues on this panel have experienced and are experiencing. So, uh, so in terms of so you know, looking at the scene from from again calm, boring, safe Dayton, Ohio, uh, uh, and looking at the statements of officials talking with different Lebanese close to decision makers, I see two scenarios. Given the equation of power that exists today, this equation could be changed. Citizen power is able to change this equation of power. Whether until now it has done a little bit in Lebanon, it has forced two governments today to resign. Whether this office power will generate or will, will, will translate into governing power, I have yet to see that. So I see Lebanon facing one of two scenarios with the current equation that exists today among political parties. One which is muddling through. 
i.e. there will be another government. It could be headed by Rafiq Hariri, uh, by, sorry, the, you know, by Saad Hariri, or it could be headed by another technocrat, Hassan Tia. But I don't see the kind of transformative change given again the political equation that exists today that Lebanese are aspiring for. And hopefully, if there is this government of when, that the focus will be of that government on financial economic reforms, partly because no country, no country will give them money and should give them money unless they undertake the kind of reforms that are needed to at least move the country's economy out of its dire straits. The other scenario, if that's not going to happen, I think the other scenario, I see more, uh, how to say, breaking apart of the Lebanese mosaic. I see regions in Lebanon starting shifting on their own. You know, uh, we talk about the importance of decentralization. That's extreme decentralization. Already the mosaic has, 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 has broken apart what made Lebanon the unique place that it is in the Levant. That has already broken apart. I think the explosion basically was the last nail in that, in that, in that, in that in that in, in the coffin basically and so 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 they are one of two scenarios both of them are bad i don't see again the transformative change uh but uh, but oh, but yeah. at least one of them can pave the ground for at least economic reforms which could be by the way an entry point into the kind of political transformation protesters want so the opposition, the opposition needs to play the long game Right. Focus for now on the economic, maybe, and then work toward the political well, in the long term. Let, Again. Me, let me jump yeah. in Jeff, just for a second, get Sarah involved in this conversation. She sees two scenarios, you know, just muddling through, uh, you know, uh, uh, basically the same thing over and over again, or perhaps uh, this kind of regionalism that she's describing. Uh, do you see that as the case as well? Consider, considering what's been happening in recent times, I don't believe that the status quo is capable at all of, of uh, maintaining its subsistence. That's mainly due to the idea that there has been a massive protest movement since October 17th, and that is way, way before we even heard of the phrase ammonium nitrate. That is before we all became chemical experts who understand under what conditions ammonium nitrate explodes and kills people, such as uh, the neighbor of Mrs. Deram. And I offer my condolences to you and to all the Lebanese people who have Thank lost you. cherished Thank you. ones, Thank you. As, as, as we have in our family as well. I think what is really important to mention and I really hope that the viewers take this in consideration is that the magnitude of this explosion does not be, does not set us just in another day in the Middle East. And I would really, really want everybody in the international community to understand that this is absolutely not another day in the Middle East. This is not just another explosion in Lebanon. It's true that Lebanon and Beirut have had more than their fair share of explosions and murderous horror over the course of the past four decades. However, this is the first explosion not only in the country's contemporary history, but in the world's contemporary history of this size, of this severity, of this magnitude, with this level of horror and this huge geographical extent. In fact, I would like to mention that a team of scientists from the University of Sheffield have estimated the strength of the explosion to be equivalent to 1.5 kilotons of TNT, which would make it the most powerful non-nuclear explosion in the history of our world. And therefore, the third largest in the world following the awful, awful explosions of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And as, as, as uh, the lady was just saying, this devastation comes on the back of the worst combination of crises that the modern world has also witnessed. So we are not only, uh, we are not only hosting the world's most awful explosion, uh, but we are also hosting uh, a combination of crises. Prior to this mad explosion, we thought that Lebanon had already undeniably reached the bottom of the abyss, which brings me to answer your question about why, why the status quo is physically impossible of being carried out. 
the miserable economic, financial, and fiscal situation, the crippling corruption, the dismal infrastructure, the massive unemployment rates, the appalling poverty numbers, the completely tone-deaf effects of a godforsaken, selfish, autocratic oligarchy whose ignorance and incompetence would baffle even medieval times. Lebanon was going through crisis after crisis that are globally unprecedented. And the curse is that it has six dimensions. We are facing an economic crisis. We are facing a financial crisis. We are facing a banking crisis. We are facing a monetary crisis as in a currency crisis. We're facing a social crisis and we're facing a political crisis. This is before ammonium nitrate. So on all fronts, it is closed for the oligarchy to move forward. On all fronts, the oligarchy needs a divine helping hand to let it at least, at least just subsist. And there is no way, there is absolutely no way that within the realm of what is expected in terms of reform, not, not to mention the incredible protest movements that they could even expect to have another normal day where they're just going to go with business as usual. Uh, Ravita, uh, I saw an interview with you some time ago where you said that uh, Beirut is a tortured city, but it keeps reinventing itself. Can it reinvent itself in a new way that, that is not as perhaps as negative as we've heard here in terms of, you know, maybe just kind of muddling through or, or the splintering that uh, Randa was talking about? Mike, you need an infrastructure for change. You need structural change in this country. Don't kid ourselves. Uh, we really shouldn't. We need to stop this uh, uh, sort of like a shallow approach by some uh, who do not understand neither the geopolitics nor the internal, ex nor the extent of the internal rot, uh, rotten uh, structure in this country. So. What you need is help from outside and help from within. You take a look at all our young people, uh, professionals, they are leaving, they're driven to leave because of the circumstances, whether it's economic, whether it is this explosion, whether it is the fear, the absolute horrifying fear of tomorrow. They can't even think of putting their kids in school. All of this is, has, has got to be addressed together with the international communities. For example, when the uh, French president came to help, and he did really uh, uh, leave a very important presence here, and hopefully he's coming back with more, and hopefully with the support of other players in the international community, not only the NATO allies, hopefully France, and uh, hopefully, I mean, uh, China and Russia too. This country has got to be saved from it's the abyss it's in. It can't do this on its own. There is a fear that if somebody, if the young people stand up to this cartel and to the arms of Hezbollah, yes, I will repeat that, that they are afraid of a civil war and they're very scared of a civil war. So there is, a, I don't find that there is a, a clear roadmap to rebuilding Lebanon. It has to happen. Somehow Beirut Beirut, the, the, the fabulous, marvelous home of mine where I was born, and I lived in New York for over 40 years. That's why I'm not a junior journalist who's just climbing somewhere. I'm someone who knows international in relations. And I am saying to you, help us. Help us by pressuring friends, if they are your friends. Help us by making sure that there are uh, it, it, it intend, I mean, there's serious uh, uh, reforms. There has to be serious reforms. Behind me is the Sarai where the Prime Minister now resigned. He sits, he resides still there. He, re he rejected the absolutely needed reforms in order to get the help of the International Monetary Fund. How callous is that? How callous is each and every? This, we have a, in the revolution, we say kullun yani kullun, which means everyone means everyone. And when I speak about the cartel of politicians, I'm talking about each and everyone. And I don't need anybody to remind me of the years before and after. But those who forgive the present uh, president and the present prime minister and the speaker of the parliament and all these politicians who knew now right now, a few months ago, that it is dangerous to keep this nitrate uh, ammonium in a civilian port, they have participated in a crime against humanity. Don't tell me it's not treason. Don't tell me it's not crime against humanity. Few months ago, and that was said by the man in charge, he said to them, 
Mr. President, Mr. Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker of the Parliament, this material in the port is dangerous. Each one of them d did something but didn't do anything that is of the, of the size of the tragedy. That's why we need help from the outside. Yeah. We need the reform, serious reform. We can't be losing our young people leaving in despair. But we need really, uh, again, the friends of Iran to tell Hezbollah it's okay to turn back to being Lebanese. We don't need the paramilitary force operating on behalf of Iran and dealing uh, uh, in, in, in Lebanon while we are still burying our deaths. So, and, and, and we need to rebuild. Uh, Sorry, I went too long. Please go ahead. Well, Randa, let me ask you about that because she brought, so brought up uh, Macron. One of the things he said is uh, that, that France is not going to sign blank checks until Lebanon is willing to make necessary reforms. So how can a country mired in decades of problems that we've already been talking about, how can it kind of turn the page? I have to say that Under Secretary of State David Hale yesterday <laughs> gave a presser in which he clearly said the same message. I mean, he clearly conveyed the same message as Macron, which is there will be short term humanitarian assistance, which is happening now. You know, there was a conference in France that netted, uh, you know, $300 million aid in humanitarian assistance. But in terms of the long term large funding that's going to require, to not only rebuild what has been destroyed by the explosion, but also to do, to help Lebanon back on its feet from the multiple crises that the fellow panelists has talked about, monetary, fiscal, you know. And I think the international community is clear. Business as usual is no longer acceptable. Even now, humanitarian assistance, they are That's now... Right to send anything through the governments. Everything is being set up through their own networks to go directly to people. And who knows, in the future, even, even absent economic reforms, absent fiscal reforms, absent serious structural reforms like Rahda was talking about, I think it's going to be hard for the international community when, when the big conference is going to be convened later in September, you know, with the World Bank, the UN, to get the billions of dollars of aid for Lebanon, it's going to be hard for them to do anything with the government again. It has to be done through, you know, alternative uh, mechanisms. The problem is that you bypass the government and absent, you know, the kind of radical transformation that I think people would like, what you continue to do with this policy is continue to hollow out state institution. We have to say that there are certain bureaucrats in government that are working hard, that are working well. Those need to be supported. <laughs> But in terms of the ruling oligarchy, the seven, eight men who rule the country, I am all with, you know, all kind of policies against them, including even sanctions. But when it comes to, but at the same time, we need to help Lebanon, but we also need to help state institution. We need to help Lebanese help themselves. We need to help Lebanon fix itself. Right. And that's this international, that's right. local coalition need to be built. Well, Dottie, let me ask you this, because Lebanon houses 1.5 million Syrian refugees, talking about helping people. Uh, what's going to be the impact this explosion is going to have on another vulnerable community with regards to these uh, Syrian refugees? Well, first of all, we know that there are 43 uh, victims dead uh, that, that were Syrian. Uh, this is like as a direct uh, impact. Uh, as, as for the refugee camps, we don't have refugee camps inside Beirut, so they weren't uh, directly uh, into the, the eye of the storm. But um, the, this, uh, I, I suppose before this meltdown, the crisis and all the, the problems that, that were re uh, completed by the, this, the recent explosion, there was like a beginning of uh, kind of movement back towards Syria. But now, um, if, you, if, if you let me speak about the verdict in the special tribunal, maybe now this would be a new page where the government or the Lebanese state can, can actually talk to the Syrian state about the, the, uh, the return of the refugees or how this would be completed. Because I, I heard someone or some reference speak about uh, around 40,000 Syrians already went back to Syria, had started to go back to their land before the COVID-19 and the crisis and all the, these problems. Problems. Um, I would like uh, just to say one one idea. When you when you're speaking about the hope for Lebanon, and we all know about the exodus that is happening now, 
uh, the, the, the junior uh, expert exodus that um, Mrs. Uh, Dergham spoke about, which is the people, the, the specialized people, the young people, we can also say that if they're not given a chance by the, by the bigger uh, generation, uh, if, they, if, you, if you're always going to speak to them condescendingly and if we always think that we know more uh, in uh, geopolitics or other than that, this is also frustrating for us because for me, I, oh, I didn't live in please, New York, spare but me, I've been to spare Iraq, me, Iran, Palestine, spare me. Uh, Egypt, spare and Syria, me. I and uh, no, I'm not speaking to you. you. I'm please me. replying to the idea. Spare me, uh, please, I, uh, please Madam, do please not let me address what my I say. Sentence. Spare me. I will not have a... Uh, All right. Uh, I'm going to have to interrupt. Well, I, do, I, I, just, I, I, I don't want this to devolve into just an me. argument. I've, I've got one final question are. for Sarah before we have to go. Sarah, um, we haven't really spoken about uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran and, and the fact that uh, in many cases Lebanon is this proxy and we've already talked about other countries and their influence. Um, and, and we've talked about young people. You're one of the young people there. What's your message? Um, I will, I will share a message. I just wanted to point out something about the refugees, just to give a little bit of some data, because if I would like to present it differently to the viewers. So Lebanon currently is hosting the largest number of refugees per capita. The government estimates 1.5 million Syrian refugees, which is equivalent to an additional 30% of our population. Uh, not not to mention approximately 20,000 refugees of other origins, in addition to an estimated 500,000 Palestinian refugees. So all in all, we have approximately 2 million refugees. That's like an extra 40% of our population. It's as if China had to accept 560 million refugees on top of its 1.4 billion. It's as if Germany had to accept 33 million refugees on top of their 83 million current residents. France, it's as if they have to accept 27 million. And for the U.S., it's as if the U.S. had to accept 131 million refugees on top of their 328 million. So just to put it in this perspective, and that is not even the headline of the crises that we are actually dealing with, I really think the state is suffocating and the Lebanese people are suffocating literally, literally from every possible point of view. So having said that, and just to go back to what you said, um, yeah, with, regards to, with, regards to, with regards to the message, there are people who were murdered. They were not, they did not die, they were murdered. There are children who were murdered. That's right. There are, pe there are people whose faces and bodies got mutilated and disfigured for life. There are children whose faces and bodies got mutilated and disfigured. There are entire neighborhoods that completely got destroyed. Hundreds of houses with traditional Lebanese architecture that have been completely razed to the ground. In of itself, this would be considered in many other places a crime against the actual cultural identity. These neighborhoods and these houses are part of our cultural That's identity right. and, an and an assault on this identity is an ex a crime in of itself. So if this is the case regarding destroyed stones, then what do we make of the case regarding murdered human beings? Well, we may be able, we may be able to bring back the stones, yes, at an enormous price that we currently cannot afford, but we can, we can possibly try and rebuild. But the human beings who were murdered and the slaughtered babies, we can't bring them back to their parents and, and to their family. And sadly, we're going to have to leave it there, Sarah. Thanks so much. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. A robust discussion, a lot to cover. And that is it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Mike Walter in Washington, D.C. Thanks so much for joining us.